Good. All right. My name is Alan Erdley. I'm on our Edge go-to-market team. And today, we're going to be talking about how you can use AWS WAF and Amazon CloudFront to secure public-facing generative AI applications. Spoiler alert, this is going to also dive into some really good just architectural best practices for some of your other applications. So if you're not doing anything with AI or generative AI or large language models today, stick around for this session because there's going to be some useful, useful content today. One of the things I wanted to start off with is just kind of substantiating some of the problems that we're dealing with out on the internet today. There's a lot of different stats out there about the, the percentage of the internet that are bots, that are non-human traffic. But generally speaking, what we typically see is that about half of internet traffic is non-human, right? 47%, 50%, somewhere in that ballpark, non-human traffic. Why does this matter to us? Well, as people that are running infrastructure, as people that are running applications, we have to pay for that, for that uh, to, to serve those requests, be, them, be those requests human or be them bot. And so this represents a bit of a problem for us that we have to deal with, at least pay attention to. And this also presents a problem in the, in the large language model space as well, um, because there are known threats that are already coming out for large language models. If you were here for the last session, you probably heard some really good talk about different threats that are, that are facing large language models. And I'm going to come at this from a little bit of a different angle, right? The public facing large language model application where it's open to the internet. And one of, those, one of the threats that OWASP has identified as a major threat that's facing large language models, generative AI applications, are model denial of service. So in this sense, model denial of service, I'm not talking about like a layer three, four DDoS attack. I'm talking about something that maybe is a little bit more sophisticated that's trying to drive costs up for us running large language models, right? For you all running large language models. And this is just fraudulent traffic that comes in, tries to, tries to make requests, and, and, and costs you money in that process. So these are a couple things that I wanted to talk about today, right? Threats to large language models from bots and the percentage of bots that are on the internet today. It represents a formidable problem that we need to figure out a way to address. And we're going to do that. So what we're going to dive into today is we're not just going to talk about security. We're going to talk about some fundamentals of how large language models work and the cost structure of how you can run those large language models, specifically Bedrock, um, uh, using, Amazon Bedrock uh, using Amazon Bedrock for those large language models. We're then going to dive into, once we kind of understand how the costing works for large language models, how we might have to prompt uh, a large language model, um, we're going we're gonna to dive into how we can use AWS WAF and Amazon Bot Control um, and Amazon CloudFront to block unwanted traffic and prevent costs uh, from, from running out of control. Then we're going to leave you with today a couple of really tactical things that you can do today to start to understand the bot problems that, are, that you may have on your applications right now, right, if you don't already. So let's dive into this. One of the things that's really important to remember about generative AI and all the large language models out there is that they're trained on a lot of data, but not all data. And so this is a, a fundamental thing that we need to understand as architects here on how we build our generative AI applications to provide the most relevant and accurate responses for our specific business needs. So we can't just use generic uh, large language models to answer all of the things that we might want to get out of it for our business. We need to figure out a way to customize those large language models. And that could be training your own large language model, which is, a, is quite the endeavor. Or there's some other techniques that we're going to talk about today. So I want everyone to imagine for a minute that we're running an application where we're trying to sell bikes on the internet. This is a passion of mine. I like to bike. And so you're all going to come along with me for this journey today on how we might start running an application if we were a bike retailer, um, and we're trying to sell bikes on the internet, and we want to create a new feature on our website that allows customers to come to our website and ask a question in natural language about what kind of bike they might want to buy. Do they want a gravel bike? Do they want a road bike? Do they want a mountain bike? Do they want a high-end bike? Do they want something different? And so somebody might come to our website and ask a question like this. What's the best bike for an intermediate cyclist? My budget is $3,000, and I want a carbon fiber bike. And we could put this prompt directly into a large language model. But there's a couple problems that we might run into. Number one, that large language model's knowledge is only trained up through a certain point in time. So that might be last model year's bikes or last model year's components or things like that. So it might not be the most relevant responses for today's consumer. 
The second thing is this uh, generic large language model might provide only answers for or generic answers across all different types of bikes, even if we don't sell those bikes. And that kind of defeats the purpose of what we're trying to do in the application that we're building. So we can do a couple things with this. We can kind of give the large language model a cheat sheet. You know, here's some additional information that we can feed into that large language model, some additional context, right? Maybe we have some internal sales documentation that talks about the best budget road bikes or cost-effective upgrades for, for, for different types of bikes or product documentation that we can control what goes into this prompt so that we give the large language model some additional context. We can also give the large language model some additional instruction here as well. So we can say things like, perform the task below using the provided context or whatever, right? This is, this is getting into prompt engineering here. But suffice it to say, what you can do here is you can give this large language model some, some guidelines on what it, should be, what it should be doing and with what information it should be doing that with. Right? So we can provide that context and those instructions. And this prompt right here will provide a much more relevant answer, a much more relevant response to the user's prompt than just asking a generic model in the, uh, without any of this additional information surrounding it. But the problem is here that this kind of comes with some additional things that we need to consider here. Right? We took what was a relatively simple prompt, only 19 words, and we augmented that prompt to add some additional instructions of about nine words and maybe some additional context that might be something like 1,200 or 1,300 or more words that we're feeding into this large language model. This is a technique, if you're not familiar with it, it's called Retrieval Augmented Generation, or RAG for short, and it's a really common way of getting um, better answers out of generic large language models that are available today. AWS has a service for it. It's called Knowledge Bases for Bedrock, and as you can see, it's a managed retrieval augmented generation service um, that's designed to provide more relevant, accurate, and customized responses to your large language model prompts. So you can see how a, a service like this would be really useful for the particular application that we're building around, around bikes. But it does come with some things that we need to consider in, in, around cost. So these are the current costs for anthropic models. And you'll notice that it's priced per thousand input tokens and thousand output tokens. Now, what's a token, you might ask, right? A token is, in our case, we're going to assume roughly four characters. Mileage may vary here. You know, you might get more, you might get more, more uh, characters per token. You might get less. It really depends on, on the words that you're using, your sentence structure, and all that kind of stuff. But for our purposes today, we can assume that one token is approximately equal to four characters. And if we look at, then, the price per token, we can see that uh, the Claude 3 Sonnet model is, uh, is 0.3 cents per thousand input tokens and 1.5 cents per thousand output tokens. So input tokens are your prompt, output tokens are what you get back from the model. So with all of this said, let's start putting this all together and let's start looking at the overall cost of running this particular large language model application. If we think of a, of a prompt that's going in that's pro approximately 1,200 words, that probably averages out to around about 1,400 tokens, give or take. At 0.3 cents per thousand input tokens, um, and then if we have a generated response that is generating you know, maybe 120 words of text, that's probably about 150 output tokens uh, at 1.5 cents per thousand. That means that the price for this one request, for a single request, is about six tenths of a cent. And if we think about the value that this is creating, if, we, if we're trying to sell a $3,000 bike, and what it takes for us to sell that $3,000 bike is for a user to come onto our website and we spend six tenths of a cent to answer their question, that's a really good return on investment, right? However, there are some things that we need to consider, especially because this is a public-facing large language model application, right? This is also ripe for abuse, that people could come on and do nefarious things and try to drive up our costs just by requesting, uh, requesting more, and more, uh, more and more answers from, from our large language model. So we can combat this, and we can do that using AWS WAF and AWS WAF bot control. If we look at the price for AWS WAF bot control, which is probably the, you know, it's like our highest end bot control uh, service that we offer, if we look at the total price per request for bot control, it's two orders of magnitude cheaper than the price for uh, that same bedrock request. So it's really substantially cheaper. And if we assume that we can block most, but maybe not all bots um, for our particular application based off of how, we, how we've tuned our, 
our bot rules, let's assume that we can block 43% of the traffic that's going into our application because we established in the beginning that about 47% of the public internet are bots. So let's assume that we can block most, maybe not all. What that means for us from a cost perspective is that for every dollar that we spend on AWS WAF bot control, we can save $277 in our generative AI costs. This is huge, right? Massive cost savings that, that we need to be thinking about every time we're, we're having a conversation about a large language model application, right? So what I'm trying to convince you all to do today is if you're thinking about large language models, especially if you're thinking about applications that is, that's using generative AI for public facing uh, applications, have WAF conversations concurrently with the architecture decisions that you're doing, that you're making for those large language model applications, right? Again, this is a mileage may vary stat, right? Depending on the, 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 the size of your input, the size of your output, the models that you're using, the percentage of bots that are hitting your application, all, all the costing and the cost savings might vary here. However, what there is is there's almost, there's almost always going to be a cost savings here um, if you're able to block bots from attacking your application. So let's dive into how this looks architecturally, right? This is probably what most applications look like, generally speaking, to start out with. Most public facing web applications, right? You've got Bedrock on the back end that's serving as your, um, your large language model API. You've got EC2, an EC2 instance that's your web server that's calling that uh, Bedrock API, or um, you know, maybe there's some other kind of compute back there. And there's a load balancer to help improve uh, some uh, resiliency um, for your application. The problem with this architecture is, is that, number one, all requests are served, right? Including all of those bot requests that are hitting this application, all of those are served. So you're incurring that six-tenths of a cent every single time a bot is hitting this application, whether that request is providing any value or not. There's also really limited resiliency from denial of service attacks, layer three, four DDoS attacks as well. So we can do better here, right? The first thing I want you to do, or the first thing that I think you should consider is just adding WAF to your load balancers, right? If you have public facing load balancers out there, just consider adding WAF to those load balancers to start. This gets you a couple things. Number one, it starts to help you block some, uh, some unwanted traffic from you know, things like known bad IP addresses or malformed requests or different things like that. But it also gets you observability into your bot problem. One of the things that a lot of our customers don't know about uh, AWS WAF is that it gets you visibility into the number of bots that are attacking your application. So if you turn on WAF, any WAF protected endpoint, you get reports on the number of bots that are attacking that application endpoint as well. So that's a really valuable thing um, that you can use that knowledge to start planning your security journey. We can do better, and um, one of the things that you should consider here is that while we're talking about this in the context of large language models, really any compute and database and any backend environment could be plugged into this particular architecture, right? So it doesn't need to be Bedrock, it doesn't need to be EC2, it could be Lambda, it could be API Gateway, it could be a lot of different things that you could be attaching, you could be using these same best practices uh, with, your, with your existing applications that you're running in AWS today. We can do better on the overall architecture design here as well, and one of the ways that you can do better is by using Amazon CloudFront. CloudFront can accelerate both static and dynamic requests. So if you have a dynamic application, you should remember that CloudFront can accelerate those, those dynamic applications as well. So CloudFront will distribute the load, create a globally available application for you. You can attach WAF directly to CloudFront, so you can block requests all the way out at the edge. And this gets you a number of different things, right? So you serve static assets, you cache static assets closer to your end users, that helps with performance. You get better resiliency from, from DDoS attacks because you're distributing load. And CloudFront has some really uh, amazing layer seven DDoS mitigation capabilities, which are uh, a, a large quantity of, of DDoS attacks today are at layer seven. So something to consider that you can attach CloudFront or you can attach WAF to CloudFront and CloudFront to your application, and you can get more performance, better security straight away um, by using those services together. Like I said, CloudFront has some really cool layer seven DDoS mitigation capabilities. There's a blog that's available to talk more about this, but what I want you to take away from this is that what you can see here is a graph of CloudFront traffic over time. And you can see two massive spikes, right? 150 million RPS uh, spikes in traffic that came in against uh, CloudFront distributions. CloudFront automatically detected this and blocked these attacks before they ever caused any disruption to, to the customers that are using CloudFront. So, 
CloudFront gets you a lot straight out of the box just by using it. So what should you do in terms of, of turning, on, turning on WAF rules? There's a couple basic ones. If you, if you aren't a WAF user today, you should know that Amazon has some Amazon managed rules that can get you started with some basic rules that are just good solid fundamentals, right? So a couple of the ones that we really like are the Amazon IP reputation list, which blocks requests from IP addresses that are known to be doing malicious things. Um, then there's the core rule set, known bad inputs that are doing some other things like blocking requests that are malformed or uh, are known to be um, uh, attack vectors and different things like that. Um, so these are really good things that you should be thinking about turning on today. Of course, WAF is a, is a journey that you can take and you can customize it to however your, however your application needs, but there are some really basic rule sets that you can get started with that get you some really good protections today. If you're a little bit weary of turning on WAF um, and you don't want to make any production changes today, you can also turn on WAF in monitor only mode if you're not, if you're not uh, already doing that today. Where you can turn on WAF, you can, you can put it in monitor only mode and that monitor only mode will um, give you visibility into what's happening without actually making any changes to the production traffic that's served. Turning on WAF is really easy to do. Um, inside of the CloudFront console, there is a one-click integration where you can, in the web application firewall section, you can say enable security protections and you can attach existing WAF rules to, uh, to your CloudFront distribution. Um, you can also say turn on uh, only in monitor only mode right here from the CloudFront distribution. And you can also use some of those Amazon managed rules and deploy them directly from the CloudFront console. So this is a really easy way to get started. Once you get started with WAF, what you can do then is, is monitor your traffic. So this is a graph inside of the CloudFront console that's available for, for free with every CloudFront distribution. And this gives you visibility and observability into the bots that you are, are currently seeing on your, on your application today. So what you should do is turn on, your, uh, turn on WAF today and let it cook for a, a couple of days. Let it, let, it, let it sit there, let, let your application traffic just be kind of normal for a couple of days. And then check out the graphs like this. You'll start to be able to see the estimates of the percentages of bots that are attacking your application today. You get even more visibility into the WAF console. And these are things that um, I like to show here really quickly, but are also really valuable if you turn them on and you can see exactly what's going on in your application environment as well. So make sure that you're thinking about turning on WAF um, so that you get that observability into those bot problems today. So let's wrap all this stuff up here real quick. So out of this conversation today, what I hope I, what I, hope I, I, I showed you is that AWS WAF is a great tool that you should be thinking about using with any new large language model application that you're building out today. But it's also great to use with your existing applications that are inside of AWS uh, today. Turning on WAF gives you visibility into some of those known bad offenders, or it can block some of those known bad offenders. It also gives you visibility into your bot problems that are attacking, that are attacking your application today. What you should do here, though, is once you turn on WAF, again, wait a week, wait two weeks, something like that, review your dashboard, see if you have a problem, and then contact us, right? Your, your account managers are happy to help with conversations about what's the next step in your security journey. So, WAF is a really easy thing to do. It gets you a lot of, it gets you some really good first steps here, but then there's ways that you can evolve this and improve your, your overall security with AWS um, through taking a couple of next steps as well. And once you talk to your account manager, make sure you're looping in an edge or security specialist. They can help out with analyzing some of those uh, results that you're seeing inside of your WAF console. They can help determine some of those next steps and recommend some bot rules that are gonna help you protect your application further. So I appreciate you all taking some time out of your day and out of, uh, out of the, the time here at Reinforce uh, to listen to this presentation. Thanks for attending today. Have a great day.